Carol McKee with Soccer 605. We're visiting here with Jean Brownell, who is the athletic director for Aberdeen School District. Uh, Merle Askey, who is the head coach for the girls' varsity program at Aberdeen. And Steve Cogley, who is the boys' varsity head coach. Appreciate you guys taking some time to visit with us today. I know we're in the middle uh, on day two of the first ever South Dakota High School Activities Association tournament. Yep. And uh, you both have teams, still have dogs in the race, and yep. we'll be playing yet today. So uh, you guys have done a great job. This has been a phenomenal event. It's really fun to be here. Yeah, thank you. Thank we're, you. We're happy to be here and excited to be a part of the history of soccer, high school soccer in South yep. Dakota. Well, I asked you guys to visit with us a little bit about um, the sanctioning process because, as you know, there's this year we're looking at two state tournaments. Mm -hmm. This is the sanctioned one. Next week will be the South Dakota Soccer Association tournament. Right. And uh, we've done some polls on Soccer 605. Early in the season, we did one and asked people if they thought that so high school soccer would ever be all sanctioned in South Dakota. The vast majority of people said yes, they thought it would happen. Um, a re poll that's actually still on the, our website at soccer605.com right now is asking people if they support sanctioning high school mm -hmm. soccer. Um, and it's, it's one of the highest response polls we've had so far this season. Right. And overwhelming majority of people are strongly supporting it. Mm -hmm. But there's still questions. We asked people if they had some questions. Yep. So we have um, some questions that have come in. I thought we'll integrate those throughout the conversation. But first off, if we could just get a little bit of the history of high school soccer in Aberdeen. Okay. So, Steve, if you want to go first. Yeah, I, th I, I think <clears throat> it all started, it, it kind of uh, just started Oh boy, back in 97, 98 was kind of the original start to it where we um, started with the process of just calling ourselves, uh, our older kids, um, uh, in the fall, a Golden Eagle team. Actually, it was in the spring, I think, originally. Um, and then from there, it just sort of gained traction. I remember when I was involved with it, it was just like, you know, we, it was, there was a bunch of people behind the scenes that really wanted to make the program as close to a high school run program as possible. And it took a number of years and every year it got better and better. Um, and I think, I'm trying to remember the very first high school tournament in South Dakota. Um, and by that point we were pretty organized. And I think it was like 98 or 99 in Pier, if I remember. In, yeah, in Pier. 98 in Pier, okay. So by that time we were pretty f fluid running the program. Um, it wasn't quite there because you know every every step there was a money problem that we would run into. We'd have to raise more money. Uh, you know, the biggest thing for us was the transportation. We wanted the kids to travel like any other varsity program would at Aberdeen Central High School. So you know, the charter busing. You know, once we got that revenue in into our uh, club program, um, uh, there was really from the time that uh, you know eventually we came to the high school. I, I guess there really wasn't a big difference other than um, all the work that everybody else was doing, Mr. Brunell was able, to, he just took it over. Oh, you were able to transfer that, that responsibility. Yes, yes, it was nice. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and really, we, I just had the coach. And that was, that was big, that was a huge thing. So, I mean, it, it was a long process. Um, but I think the program that we were able to give to them, to the school here, was, was in pretty good shape at the time. Uh, basically, it was you took the program you had and put it into the Aberdeen schools. Yes. So, yeah. Um, Jean, I wanted to ask you a little bit about <coughs> what kind of support there was um, on the school board, for example, in bringing soccer into the school. Well, school boards, <coughs> of course, are political animals, and so what what you have to do is put them in a position where uh, they can politically um, adopt soccer as part of part of their uh, high school sports curriculum. Uh, and to, and to be able to do that, of course, uh, is not an easy task, and particularly right now because of the extreme difficulties all the public schools are having uh, making ends meet. But, you know, if you look at the future of soccer in South Dakota, uh, it, it'll be about school boards and money because it's not about want to or willing to or need to. You know, I, I believe all kids should have the opportunity to play the game of soccer inside the high school facility and inside the high school organization. The two gentlemen on my left, their responsibilities really are just to coach. We're, we will do the other things that, that need to be done, and that's how it works for all the other kids and all the other sports, and, and we shouldn't uh, leave our soccer program uh, on the outside looking in. But that's what it, it'll, it'll be about, those, those two things. And 
what we were able to do through the help of, of some very hard-working, dedicated people on the soccer side is we were able to put our board in a position where they could say yes. Now, not all of them were happy with this. We had a seven-person board, and it was a five-to-two five to vote. But adding a new sport at the time we did it, is it seven years now, gentlemen? Yep. 2005. Uh, yep. Adding a new sport then was not as difficult as it is now. And, of course, the other thing is you always have to do is, uh, if you can, uh, when you want something from a public board, you have to put them in a position where they really can't say no. And our soccer people did that by raising all the money to run the program the first year, half the money to run the program the third year, and then a fourth of the money to run the program the, the last year. And as soon as they, they committed to do that, then these gentlemen and all the kids that play for them, of course, became part of our athletic department. And uh, yeah. So then let me understand, the, the first year, half the money was raised by the local soccer people? Actually, all, all of it. All of it. Okay, they the paid second the program. Year, half of it? Half of it. And, and the, the third, third year, year? The fourth, and then the fifth year? Uh, well, no, the, the fourth year the school district took it in. Right now, the, the, the system that, that's set up is the schools have a five-year transitional period. Okay. And what they need to do is make the commitment to the Activities Association that five years from now, we will fully fund the entire soccer program. And then what they need to do is have an agreement with their soccer association on how we're going to pay the bills between then and the time that the schools uh, take over. And as soon as they're able to make that commitment, if the school boards and the administration will make the commitment, the soccer uh, association, that community is uh, on, on board with it, then they can begin to play uh, in the activity association sponsored state tournament uh, and so forth uh, immediately. So they can make the commitment but not be fully? Not be fully funded, but after five years, then everything has to be in the school. That does bring up a question. One of the issues that has been raised uh, from, from our followers is South Dakota has, uh, in 1995, uh, but then Attorney General Mark Barnett issued a, a, an opinion that it was, uh, we could not have pay to play for activities in our high schools, our public schools. So in those first few years, if, during the transition, the soccer association was paying part of the funds. Are the players assessed a fee? How do we avoid that? opinion that's out there. Well, you're talking about two different things. If the soccer association provides money to the school, it's a donation. If the kids are responsible to pay for anything, then you're probably in violation of the of the uh, attorney general's uh, probably in violation of the attorney general's opinion. Every student in South Dakota uh, has a right to a free public education. That, in the Attorney General's uh, opinion, and that's been for several other Attorney Generals since then, means that uh, you really cannot charge fees unless the, the state legislature specifically guarantees you the right to do that. Right now, a public school can only charge a fee for parking. Okay. They cannot charge a, a, a fee for any other sport. So then I can go back to the Pierce School District and ask, ask them to reimburse me for the, the rental fees for my son's saxophone, right? <laughs> well, <it's, laughs> actually, uh, it's a rental fee, though. Oh, okay. Now, if you're renting, that's different than... Okay. Now, did, did he pay to play or did he pay to rent? He had to have the instrument to play, so... Uh, <laughs> that, yeah, you have I to. Digress. <laughs> <laughs> I digress. But I see if they play. charged you rent and then $400 more to be part of the band, now that's a different deal. Okay. All right, all right. That, that does provide some clarification. So, you talked about the, the soccer community basically uh, putting the school board in a position. I've had, had politicians tell me this before. What you're, you're proposing is a great idea. Now go out there and make me do it. Make me support yeah, it. Because they, they have to think about the, mm -hmm. the other that's population. What you have to do. So, what were some of the other concerns that they had other than funding? I, were, I, you mentioned earlier that you, when you guys adopted the program, it was easier than now because school boards weren't facing as many cuts. Did you have other sports that we were looking at possibly cutting because of funding issues? Or no. were there other sports that were wanting to be sanctioned at the same time? No. Uh, we would not cut uh, one sport to, to add another. That's ridiculous. Uh, uh, what, what really happened at, at that time is just common sense prevailed. You know, the, the athletes uh, wanted to be part of the system and the parents wanted to be part of the system. It was a matter of, of money and, and politics to, to really make that uh, thing work. But we, we didn't have any other sports at the time that were really knocking at the door. 
and you know, for the South Dakota High School Activities Association to even consider us, this had to be in the hands of the uh, State Soccer Association. They had to come to the board and say, we want you to do this. Because the board was not going to take over, the activity Association was not going to take over soccer and make 5,000 parents mad. That wasn't the goal. If the parents and the associations wanted to do it, then we will do it. If they don't want to do it, then we won't want to do it. And that would be the same thing that would happen to sports that are out there now, like uh, a softball or baseball or hockey. You know, if you want to run your own program, go ahead and run your own program. If you want to have the program inside the school and have the benefits and, and the in, uh, inclusiveness mm -hmm. of being part of the entire system, uh, then, you know, then we can start talking with Turkey. Yeah. And that makes total sense. Um, it would have been a little difficult to try and require it to happen without parental support. And you brought up another good point, costs. Um, Steve mentioned earlier that providing busing so that the teams could travel like any other varsity sport was a big part of what they were looking for. Um, what are some of the other costs that you had to consider in bringing it in, and what does Aberdeen pay for then? Well, all the costs are there. Transportation is one of them, and it's a fairly large one. It costs us just about as much money for transportation as it does for salaries and benefits. And then, of course, we also have overnight stay that's expensive. We have uniforms, we have nets, we have goals, we have all of the normal things that, that are there. The, the two programs together cost us a little less than $50,000. Okay. But we are really uh, probably a fairly expensive program because 40% of the costs of our program are really just transportation and motels. Another 40% of that, or 41% of that, is uh, the coaching salaries and benefits. So and that's Merle's the, fault. Yeah, that's Merle's yeah. yeah. fault. Yeah. 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 <laughs> those are the things that, that really uh, uh, add up. You know, obviously balls, we have to buy balls every year, we have to buy uniforms on a regular rotating basis, we have to do those things. Those things don't, you know, that's the same thing we do with everything else. A booster club can, can raise funds to pay for uniforms though, right? Well, yes they can, but we really, you know, would want our booster club not to provide the basic elements that are there. Transportation, salaries, uniforms, the other equipment. We would like the, the uh, booster club to enhance some of the things that we have, not take the place of. Okay. I feel, and I've lived in South Dakota my entire life, and I've, uh, this is my 42nd year in this business, I believe that the taxpayers of South Dakota have made a commitment to, for two extracurricular co-curricular activities that they need to fulfill. And that means I have to pay taxes, my children are no longer in school, and they're no longer in the athletic programs, but I am more than willing to pay my fair share of whatever taxes it need to make sure that other people's children have the same benefit mine had. Sometimes in South Dakota, because we're so conservative, we don't see beyond the end of our own nose. And we are responsible to other people and to other people's children. And we need to come to grips with that social contract a little bit. Well, and I think uh, without getting too far off the topic, it is topical that study after study has shown that extracurricular activities, sports, and other activities do uh, make for a better rounded, more productive, uh, and more intelligent student. Mm -hmm. so student athletes are a, a big bonus and they also help build your sense of community in the school. The, the students that are involved in co-curricular and extracurricular activities do better in the classroom. <coughs> They come to school more often. They have less tardies. They have fewer discipline problems. They have better relationships with their parents because they're with their parents more because they're traveling and doing those things. They have better relationships with their peers. All of the kinds of things that you want. And then they learn the skills that you want. They learn by example from these gentlemen on my left how to lead, how to communicate, how to organize, how to prioritize, what's the work ethic like. One of the yep. best things about athletics that people don't even think of is that they have to understand that they're not the center of the earth or the universe, that they're part of a group of people and they have to learn how to work, how to work yep, and, and, and right. do with things. It does help them understand this uh, sense of community and responsibility to sure. others. Mm -hmm. And that's what we want to... I think that's what we want to raise our, our kids yeah. with. So. Dis discipline and, and uh, being responsible to others is critical. Yeah, that's so true. So, uh, speaking of the coaches and, and salaries, what were some of the considerations? Because one of the other questions that has come in is, one of the concerns people have out there is, um, is the soccer program going to be now coached by uh, the eighth grade te history teacher that doesn't really know soccer? 
personally, in my opinion, I think we have a lot more people now that know soccer, and there's probably in every school district now mm -hmm. someone who has some soccer experience. So it's not quite the same issue it was back in the late 90s, early 2000s. But what were some of the considerations in hiring the coaches? Well, what we wanted to do was uh, to find professional people that would take care of the program, take care of our kids. And obviously, uh, in school, there were no soccer coaches in school, no one with any experience. So we're, we were going to hire soccer coaches that came from the soccer association. And the two gentlemen on my left are, are, are a perfect example of that. And, and obviously they've both been college coaches, they've both been high school coaches, they've both uh, won state championships. Uh, that is where you go. Obviously, um, every school would like to have this. We'd like to have every member of our staff a professional educator. But that doesn't always work. And especially in a, in a situation where we have basically uh, uh, no uh, uh, educators that ha have a soccer background. So we've got to take care of the kids first, no matter who coaches them. Now, on the other hand, these two gentlemen have the exact same professional responsibilities and, and the expectations that we would have if we had our eighth grade science teacher uh, doing that. You know, they, uh, they, they know what they are and they get the job done. Well, that's a perfect transition, Merle. What are your responsibilities as a, a high school coach and how have you seen the transition to a sanctioned program be different than it would, was before it became sanctioned? Well, I think, I think the biggest thing for us um, as coaches is just, is just um, to be professional and, and, and give the athletes an opportunity to compete and to develop as, as, as young adults. Um, and I think that's that's the biggest the biggest key for us is just to put them in situations where they can be successful. You know, we're not always going to win every game. We're not always going to win every every tournament. But the biggest thing for them is to is to learn how how to how to go out and compete and and deal with winning and deal and deal with losing. Um, and the other thing, the transition period, you know, it, it really worked, you know, it was pretty flawless for us because we were running a pretty pretty high, high level program before we came into the school district and it worked really well and, and now being in the school, it's really, you know, the, the athletes are so much more comfortable with where they're at, um, they're they're able to intermix with their peers, the other athletes in the school, the other students in the school, look to them and talk to them about what they're doing and what they're going after. Um, and before that, before we were sanctioned, you know, they were they were just another, you know, the, the parents had to dismiss them from school and they were always gone and people, you know, weren't really interested in what they were doing. Um, now the, 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 the students themselves and a lot of the other staff members and stuff talk to them on a daily basis about what they're doing, you know, how their team's doing, you know, wishing them good luck, to, you know, patting them on the back when they're doing well. You know, and the same thing happens in the community when, when, when we're going, when we're within the school district, through the community we get a lot more community support, you know, there's a lot more people walking up and talking soccer to you, asking you how your team's doing, where you're going, you know, and, and me not being, you know, in, in, the, in teaching, you know, I work, for, I work for this, um, the state of South Dakota, you know, a lot of my coworkers, you know, ask me, you know, how's things going, you know, how's the team doing, you know, read, read your article, you know, read the article in the paper, you guys had a couple of good wins this weekend, you know, and it just, it just really, uh, it not only builds within the, the school itself, but it builds within the community a, a pride and, and, and a sense of belonging to the, to something bigger than yourselves, and, and I think the students really benefit from that kind of an atmosphere. Yeah, and I, I guess, having been a student man, team manager when we had a, a, a high school team, I, I had to always remind the parents to call and get the kids released. So that's a nice benefit to not have to deal with even just that minor detail. What these two gentlemen are talking about, of course, is the concept of educational athletics. And, and if, if the, what we do athletically is not part of the child's overall education, then what we're doing is wrong. And neither of these gentlemen have degrees in education, but both of these are very well-educated men and they understand the importance of education. You know, we'll want to win whenever we can. You know, uh, we have one gentleman uh, uh, going on the boys' side for third today and the other for the state championship. We also know that, that that's important. We're going to try to do everything within the rules to win. Sometimes we do that, and of course sometimes uh, uh, we do not. But what we're really emphasizing is, is letting the kids learn and grow through athletics. Athletics isn't any different than algebra, it's just a different field of competition. And both of these gentlemen understand that. And you know they've been very good with the kids, and um, they, they fit us like a glove. Uh, I was here when both of them were hired. Yeah, and I'm very proud of both of them, and they've done a great job, and uh, we will continue to employ them for a long period of time. Oh, that's good to hear. Yes. Yeah. <laughs>
just got a contract extension yeah. on video. <laughs> um, Steve, uh, he brings up a very good point. As a becoming a sanctioned coach mm -hmm. for any athlete, Activities, I think, in South Dakota. Are there some requirements that you had to go through that were different than you did before the sanctioning process? Was there some testing involved? Yeah, there are. There's there, there's things within the district that we're required to do. Um, there's um, well, first of all, you know. All, Mr. Bernal does such a good job with keeping all the coaches connected. You know, there's there's meetings with all the coaches that cover all the school policies, the district's policies that are important. Some of those things, you know, like sexual harassment, uh, um, making sure that uh, uh, the, the kids understand, you know, their requirements in class and just the overall emphasis on what, what's going to be important within the kids' education are things that we have to do. It's nothing soccer specific or football specific that, that, that are required. You know, we have that support if, you know, if we feel like we need to go get some uh, additional training on our particular sport, we, we have the access to that. Oh yeah, that's yeah, nice. Yeah. That's nice. I had heard, um, I'm talking with Dean Bourne of Sioux Falls Christian. Mm -hmm. Some studying that he, he did, you know, having even though he's been a soccer coach for quite some time to become a sanctioned coach. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, We're in a school. Yes, we are. We're in a school. We're going to be school, school announcements. Yep. <laughs> we'll just wait. Part of the process. That's part of the process. That's, uh, it's nice to be able to be here actually in the school and know yeah. that, that the Aberdeen Central logos that you guys have yeah. on your shirts, that you actually own them with the team. They're no yeah. longer just rented and borrowed from the school. Yeah. That's one of the movies I that's, see that That's really important for the kids. It you is. Know, as Merle mentioned, you know, the, the kids are part of the solution, not on the outside looking in, right. which is never a good place for kids to be. <clears throat> You know, that's that's the, one of the things. If, if I feel proud of anything that we've done with the soccer program, and it's it's been a lot of fun for me, it's the fact that soccer is no different today than football or cross country or basketball or track and field or volleyball is. It's all the same. We don't look at our athletes any different. We don't think about our athletes any different, and we don't treat our athletes any different. Well. It, they're all the same, but soccer's just a little bit better. <laughs> <laughs> well, you better go talk to the football coach because he'll well, tell you me know, the you same thing. You, you, we, we, take for granted, we take for granted so many little things. I, I just remember the first time I remember uh, seeing like, you know, like schools put together like their ac fall activities uh -huh. uh, schedules. You know, you have your football and your sophomore football and your volleyball and your basketball or whatever it may be. But then, you know, I remember a kid holding one that, you know, had the, the soccer schedule on it. You know, and he, had, and I just remember him being smiling, and you know, seeing the that on there. Exactly. Something as small as that, yep. you know, makes an impact on a kid. You know, it does. Well, you two both come come from the soccer community into the, the school community, and one of the things you were doing that has happened in the interim um, is the same thing that's gone on in Sioux Falls and Rapid City is looking at. Sioux Falls used to have uh, Dakota Gold, they mm -hmm. had Great Plains, and Sioux Falls Soccer Association are now um, Dakota Alliance Soccer. You guys had Aberdeen Soccer Association yep. and Northern Glass Club and have now merged into the um, Hub City. City Soccer. How did that, those transitions and changes in the soccer community impact the transition to sanctioned high school soccer? Ooh. Um, it provides a huge base of volunteers, first of all, and support um, to help. You know, there are there are so many people building up from '98, '99, all the way up to 2005 when that vote finally occurred in the school board. That put so much effort and time, and all of those people were our you know, primarily our soccer people, mm -hmm. you know, that, that have been involved with Aberdeen Soccer at that particular time or Northern Blast or you now, you know, Hub City Soccer Club. You know, I can, th I, I don't want to name names, but you have yeah. the Suttons and the, and the, um, the Heipels, Lover. yeah. Larry Lover. Larry Lover, and I mean, so many people that, that put so many hours into to making sure that these programs were essentially treated the same and then eventually that required a huge base of information that needs to get out to the public about what these programs are about and how important it is to the kids and their overall education. So if I'm understanding correctly Steve, the transition to the sanctioning of high school soccer right. actually helped bring your soccer community together sure. and actually helped create the entity that now is Hub City? Or no, well yes. I, here's my question. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, maybe I'm confused. Yeah. I, I'm wondering if there, as you were going through that transition in the soccer community, separate from sanctioning, yeah. but, but by the merger of, of the rec and the club programs, if that would have impaired 
board movement on the sanctioning. I don't think so. It, it didn't appear to. No, no. Have anything no. to do with it? No. Yeah. yeah. Well, and the the merging of our clubs realistically was just. Uh, the right thing to do. Well, it was the right thing to do. It was, it was just a, to ease our process in the club side, and we were actually already three, three or four years into the into the high school before that ever came about. Mm -hmm. So we've only been we've only been merged as a, as a, on the soccer side of it for a couple of years. So realistically, that transition came well enough after that it didn't affect the high school at all. You know, our players are still our players, and and we it just helped our players on the soccer side. Be able to be be one united and and at links is closer to the to the youth kids, um, which help which are going to be the basis for building our program in the future and that's that's a big key for us is to keep get our youth ki kids involved in what we're doing here. So, yeah, really the sanctioning, you know, as you're saying, the sanctioning part of it for us, um, I guess for the kids and for us coaches, to be honest with you, other than our schedules change a little bit, there isn't. You know, for us, it's not a big difference. I mean, we've been doing this for since you know 2005. It's been the same for us. Um, you know, we play our schedule. We're just playing, you know, some sanctioned teams and you know our, our typical ESD schools that we want to play. You know, our Watertowns and, and our uh, Pier, and I think we played uh, uh, Mitchell. 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 Yeah. I mean, so. For us, it hasn't been a huge thing, but you know, for everybody else, it provides that extra exposure. You know, for us, it was more of a local thing. You know, with working with our school district at the time, where you know sanctioning wasn't even there yet. You know, but but it was the right thing to do for our kids within our within our own local area here. But now, I think the whole sanctioning thing adds an extra element for people who don't have it now. So now it's more. I don't know what the word I'm looking for, but it's you know it's it's more in the eyes of those uh, maybe those other school boards that now you know it is now obviously it's not stopping it's it's with our our. This subject. isn't you know we've gone through this before when I first came into this business in the early 70s, <clears throat> girls track and field got started and it got started outside the activities association. It was started by people who were interested in track and field. And parents uh, did it, did the whole thing. And finally, everybody said, doesn't it just make kind of sense for this to come in? And it did. And the next one uh, came in the, in the 1980s with volleyball. And it's the same process. Volleyball was out there being offered in schools, and they were competing and doing those things. But there were no a culminating event and, and no sanction. Well, common sense said, well, well, the same thing happened with soccer. South Dakota is not a very progressive state as far as adding a lot of things. Uh, the concept of minimal change is alive and well. Uh, well, we like to think about things for a while. 20 yeah, years. Yeah, 20 years or so. <laughs> That's exactly correct. But at least when, the, when you have the opportunity, and lots of schools have the opportunity now to do this. Because uh, politically speaking, this, this is a, a bit of a hot potato. But, but financially speaking, it can be done. We've done it, and we haven't shut the lights off, or we haven't cut in other sports, and we haven't cut any other activities, and we don't stop doing this or don't stop doing that. And we did it because that was what was best for the kids, was the right thing to do. And that's what other schools have to look at. Yes, finances are a question, but is it the right thing to do? And if it is, then figure out a way to get it done. So, uh, just from what you've told me here, I want to make sure I'm understanding this correctly. Um, and what I'm hearing is it's financial every school district and everywhere. Uh, there's also some school, some communities that are going through some potential transition within the soccer community and um, have to decide whether they can do that. But, but the financial part of it can be done in a fashion like you guys did, where if you just make a commitment, that the school district makes a commitment to do it, you can have a transition period where the soccer community can continue to fund it like we do right now. Mm -hmm in a lot of the areas and just transitionally, incrementally reduce that and shift it. The politics is critical uh, because it's very difficult for a superintendent and a board to make cuts in other areas that, that are being forced upon them and then add a band or add a soccer team or, yeah. or add anything. The, you know, the, the political end of that is, is what gets in, in the way. And then we, we don't know what funding is going to come from the state legislature, so we'll see. Probably the most critical issue that uh, will impact soccer, along with a lot of other things, will, will take place on Election Day. If the initiative passes and we add a one-cent sales tax, that half of that money will, will go really to, to Medicaid and to, to take care of our senior citizens who really, in 
uh, monetarily may not be able to take care of themselves in, in hospitals and nursing homes, and then the other half sent to education. That will make a huge step in the right direction. If that fails, then both grandma and grandpa and uh, their grandchildren are going to have to continue on with a, a system that is there. <clears throat> South Dakota is not a, a state that does not have means. We have means. <clears throat> we can do uh, whatever it is we want to do. The question is if we have enough courage and, and uh, foresight to be able to do it. And that takes strong leadership. Leadership that can stand up and say, you know, <clears throat> these are hard times, but these are about, this is about grandma, grandma, and a kid, grandkid. Let's get it done, do it right. Well, that's, I got a couple more questions for you guys mm -hmm. as coaches, for your fellow coaches. Mm -hmm. One of the concerns people have had out there is if you move it to the school, then you lose the ability to control when the season is. Have you had any concerns about that? Like what do you mean season? That um, it may shift as some states have done. To, to the spring? spring. I, you, we would. I, I guess we wouldn't have any control over that. Yeah, obviously that would come from the athletic directors and the administrations. But I can't imagine why they change it. You know, I. I, I well, we do have some states that surround us that have some. Yep. But actually, from what I understand, they're looking at going to fall as well. So. Right. I'll give you a little history on that. When it was first proposed, the uh, executive group of the South Dakota High School Activities Association wanted the boys in the fall and the girls in the spring. spring. I was vehemently opposed to that and we worked and I was part of the soccer committee that that uh, worked with the executive group and the board of directors and we got that back where, it at, where it's at. We have a very busy fall. Yeah, we do. Very, very busy. We have 11 sports going on right now at, at all levels, but we can do it. And, you know, we have all kinds of football teams, we have all kinds of soccer teams that go on and use that same facility. In our facility out here, Northern State University uses it, Presentation College uses it, Ron Colley High School and ourselves are there. And we don't have any many major scheduling problems. And it sure doesn't look any worse for the wear either. No, it's a great, it's a great place to, uh, to play. And, and uh, yeah, our, our soccer teams are, are just like our football teams and uh, anyone else. So moving it into the spring, I think that would be a huge error, and, and I don't think that would ever happen. Yeah. Oh, that, that's been one of the concerns. That, really? Uh, yeah. yeah. We've heard that. Uh, it's, I think it's diminishing over the years as there, people are seeing other sports go in. So what would you say to your fellow coaches who are on the on the other side right now? Yeah. And, and the dark side, as you probably are thinking of it as, yeah. no, non-sanctioned soccer. Uh, has it been a good move? Yeah, oh, absolutely. It's a, it's a no-brainer. Yeah, I mean for us, I mean for us, it's it, it's always a good move. Like like I said, for us, it, it builds within your community and within your school, you know, a lot more, a lot more, you know, support. Um, and and the other thing is, you know, um, you know, from the, a lot of conversations I've had with Mr. Brownell, you know, athletic directors are going to hire coaches who are able to coach. They're not going to, you know, they're not going to put people in charge of soccer that don't know anything about soccer. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, for the most part, it, it's just not going to happen. Um, so the you know the the coaching the coaching stuff you know is, is it will get taken care of you know the, the, they just have to be willing to commit to the the program and commit to to the rules that the, that the school is going to have I mean that there's going to be you know you know you have your contact rules and a lot of different things will change but that doesn't mean you know we we've worked through our competitive program and, and we we've built a base of coaches that help us out and, and continue to work with our athletes when when they need to be worked with. You know, and, and you know, and our programs continue to grow and get better, and, and that's that's what's going to happen. Um, the coaches just got to be willing to, you know, to, to support that, and and you know, like I said, they'll just have to work with their athletic directors and, and their schools and, and and get the process started. I think one thing that they have to remember is this: is that no athletic director is going to take on a program and wants it to be poor. You know what I mean? The program reflects upon the athletic director, and the last thing that they want to do is have a poor program. So they're going to put every resource they have or have available to them to make sure that the program is run right. And what I love most about the high school program, first of all, is the kids really enjoy playing for their for their school. They do. I mean, I I coach on all levels, and I I know the difference. Playing for your club is important. But the sense of that for that two months, there's nothing better than this high school season for these kids. And for the coaches, when you get when it goes into the district, you have a responsibility to be a coach. Because that's what we are. Coach. We're not administrators, so to speak. And we don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. You know, I want to coach the kids. 
and and that's the that's the big thing for the our coaches to know is that once it's there that's what you get to do you get to be their coach you know and the athletic director will worry about making sure you have the resources necessary to make it be successful you don't have to worry about recruiting a team manager no <laughs> no we have student <laughs> managers student that's, managers that's, that's me and then you can develop the leadership of the student manager right. yep and as a, and you're the new team manager for the team. That's yeah. what we function. <laughs> you seem to be doing that job quite well for Yes, you. he well, does. I don't know if we are or not, but that's what we yeah, do. Yeah, he is. He well, gentlemen, know. I really want to thank you yeah. and give you an opportunity yeah. to add last comments. Yeah. Uh, this summer I had the uh, pleasure of uh, attending a conference where Merrill Hodges, I don't know if you know Merrill or not, but he is a, a football player, a professional football player, who uh, graduated from Idaho and, you know, was a running back and ended up with the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers, were extremely successful. Then after leaving it, of course, uh, uh, he uh, contracted cancer and uh, uh, defeated that. And what, what he did was to, was to share with us uh, his philosophy, and I think this is a philosophy that should probably be listened to by schools that aren't sanctioned. And his philosophy uh, from the time he was in middle school to high school to college and professionals was find a way. And that's what you have to do. And if you have bright, articulate individuals in charge of schools and, and, and uh, soccer associations, let's sit down and figure out what it takes to get to where it is and how to do it with, without uh, causing a, a, any sort of melee in the community or, or the state and get it done for the kids. That's the right thing to do. Sounds like a good place to stop there. Yep. Thank you, gentlemen. Good luck in your games this afternoon. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, Thank you very much. much. I better go to work. Go to work. Okay.